When we talk about our best moments, they include humanity's first steps on the moon. That's one small step for man. Alongside stories about the steps we're taking right now. At one of our country's greatest institutions, Purdue University. Beauty, highlighted by brick, its fountains and traditions. A campus that stretches across 2,500 acres, nestled in the heart of America. And you can feel it in the hearts of the people here. Hardworking, welcoming, and guided by integrity. A family of students and professors who are in this together, all taking the next step, one foot in front of the other. The kinds of innovations that will help solve the world's greatest problems. Persistently pursuing, relentlessly rethinking. The next game changers, difference makers, ceiling breakers, innovators, boilermakers. Oh, I see the smile running across your face in the sunrise lights up another day. never stop. We keep going because there's so much to uncover. And we keep going because discovery is in our DNA. We keep going because it's just as much about the journey as it is about the win. This isn't just a home. This is a launch pad, a community that will propel you on your course out into your limitless future, filled with promise and purpose and all the tools and resources for your personal mission, encumbered by nothing. Empowered by everything, we are removing barriers and raising expectations. Stand up, Boilermakers, each and every one, with more than 630,000 alumni who have your back for life. Two words say it all. Boiler up. Our greatest adventures are yet to come, and they include you and everything we will experience together when you take your next giant leap. Well, good morning, everyone in, in the U.S. Good evening, everyone in India. For, thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Herleman. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at Purdue and executive director for international advancement. I'd really like to welcome you to the seventh annual India Purdue Collaborative Lecture Series. Now, this is in honor of Professor Bharat Ratna, Professor CNR Rao one of our most distinguished uh, Purdue alums. And India is a key strategic partner nation. So we have an India initiative uh, that's uh, very active. And this lecture series is the highlight of our annual India-related programming. Now, in previous years, six previous years, we came to India with a delegation, including one of our top faculty from Purdue, and gave lectures, uh, visited universities, visited companies, and uh, held a cultural event at the end. Of course, this year we had to pivot like everyone. And so we've gone virtual and we have uh, five great events. And we're, this is the third, it's the Agritech panel. Now these are all uh, aligned with the persistent pr pursuit of the next giant leap, like, uh, linking back, of course, to Neil Armstrong. So we're delighted to have you and excellent panelists and reviewers from around the world to join us today. Now, I first need to thank our sponsors uh, for this event and, and helping us carry it on over all these years. Uh, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, GVK, SMT. We also have TBS Motor Company and then the Purdue uh, Alumni Association there in India. I'd like to now introduce the uh, moderator for our great panel today. It's Professor Jerry Shively. He's the Associate Dean in the College of Agriculture at Purdue and also the Director of International Programs in Agriculture. He's on the Faculty in Agricultural Economics. He's been here since 1996 and he does great work in ag development, food security, natural resource management, and uh, is just a great leader across campus for our international outreach. So, Jerry, thanks you so much for doing this today and welcome. Thank you, Dan, and thanks for that 
uh, kind introduction. It's great to be here and I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to moderate today's session. Uh, for those who are joining us live, there's going to be a Q&A session that you can participate in. We'll hold all of the questions until the end of the, the presentations. For those of you who are uh, joining us after the live event, we certainly hope you'll um, benefit from this. Um, in addition to thanking the organizers for inviting me, I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting agriculture on the agenda for this lecture series. Um, I think that we all recognize that there are many, many challenges facing uh, the global community. Perhaps none is greater than the challenge of feeding the world sustainably, um, a growing population that uh, deserves improvements in nutrition and food security and, and agriculture is at the heart of that. Um, it's certainly true that nowhere or, or only very rarely have countries been able to pursue their goals of economic development um, by, by bypassing agriculture. Uh, agricultural strategies are always central to the process of economic development. That's for two reasons. One is that uh, a population must be well nourished in order to be productive, and that nourishment comes from agriculture. Uh, and second, at early and, and middle stages of economic development, a very large proportion of the population of a country is engaged in agriculture. And um, therefore, to neglect agriculture is to neglect a very large part of the population. And I think nowhere is this borne out more clearly than in, in India, where agricultural development is central to the country's development aims and, and goals. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and we'll, we'll very quickly um, begin to talk about agricultural technology. But before we do that, I would just like to pause for a moment um, to keep uh, India in our thoughts. Um, there are tremendous challenges globally in fighting the pandemic, uh, nowhere um, more acutely than in India at present. The, the recent data seem to be uh, indicating perhaps a, a positive turn of event, events, but there are tremendous challenges ahead. There's been tremendous loss of life, and I just want to um, pause for a moment and acknowledge um, the challenges currently being faced and, and the losses that um, others have experienced. So um, with that, let me just make a couple of introductory remarks. And I don't want to spend a lot of time because I want to maximize the time available for the presentations, the discussions, and the Q&A. Um, first, let me just say that, that the theme for this session is agri-tech. Um, agricultural technology, I think, should be understood in the broadest possible way, uh, stretching all the way from improved seeds to machinery to data and information technology. And so as we, we discuss technology today, we want to keep in mind that technology can come in many, many different forms. Um, some of that technology is embedded directly um, and other is not. Uh, sometimes technologies can only be utilized if they're successfully paired with a workforce that's ready to use that technology. And so, as I think about the prospects for agricultural technology, I think that there are often, or there is in this case, three central challenges that rise to mind. The first is that um, agric agricultural technology, especially to be um, contributing to sustainable development goals, must put resource management uh, at the center of concerns. Um, Clearly, soil and water is important to the, the productivity and sustainability of agriculture in the long run. And so technology um, must be, be viewed with resource management in mind. The second central challenge, I think, that will surface during our discussion today is the role of labor. Um, and I raise the, the issue of labor for two reasons. One. Um, 
it's almost always the case that new technologies result in disruptions and changes to the labor force. We can think about um, the introduction of mechanical threshing in the 19th century, um, the transition from animal traction to, to tractors, or the adoption of, of hybrid seeds in the US and elsewhere in the 1930s and 40s. Clearly, if we think about the Green Revolution in, and how it affected labor use in India, there's often uh, a release of labor and we have to think about the importance of technology in affecting uh, how labor is used in agriculture. Uh, the second, I think, important aspect of labor when we think about technology is, as I said before, not all technologies can be used um, without an upgrade in workforce. And the need for skill development is uh, a very important one. And technologies on their own are rarely successful unless the labor that goes along with that technology, the workers who are empowered with that technology, have the skills necessary to use that technology. And clearly we could think about um, that in the context of new technologies, um, things like drones, but also uh, information technology and the use of um, new forms of machinery and the like. Uh, so we have to think about what kinds of skills are needed to go along with technologies. And, and then the third central challenge, I think, that comes along with innovations in technology are the, uh, their potential, potential impact on social structures. And we know from the history of the Green Revolution in India that uh, new technologies, new forms of agriculture um, have the potential to alter social structures and um, in some cases to be um, contributing to equitable development and equitable growth, but in some cases um, perhaps uh, intensing, intensifying divides between the haves and the have-nots, those who have access to technology and those who do not. And I think as we look forward to uh, innovations that are very heavily in, uh, embedded in data needs, uh, the, the concerns about a digital divide between some groups uh, should make us all cognizant of the, the special role that we have to pay attention to social structures as technologies are adopted. So these are big central challenges, resource management, um, the role of labor and, and skill and workforce development, um, and the importance of social structures. Fortunately, we have three thought leaders on these topics who are going to join us today. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce each of them or all of them together quite briefly. Um, their full bios are available elsewhere and so I won't belabor the point. Um, uh, but what I will say is that these three themes and central challenges that I've kind of outlined, uh, I think, uh, align very, very well with the, the remarks that they have planned uh, and the discussion that I think will ensue. First, we have Sean Ferris. Sean is the Director of Agriculture and Livelihoods at Catholic Relief Services uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. Catholic Relief Services, of course, a, a global um, uh, NGO that works across a broad spectrum um, of concerns, but in particular in agriculture. And we're very lucky to have Sean join us today. And Sean, I think, will start us off by talking about some of the evolutions that have taken place in agriculture and how technology has played a role in that, um, and especially thinking about this concern of resource management. Uh, our second speaker will be my colleague from Purdue, uh, Professor Darmendra Saraswat. He's a associate professor of agricultural and biological engineering. Um, and I think as his uh, presentation unfolds, we'll focus very, very clearly on agritech innovations in India, uh, the current trends that, that are being displayed in India, uh, the kinds of gaps that are being filled, 
and I'm very I'm looking very uh, much forward to his contribution today. Uh, and then as we become ever more specific in our focus, um, our third panelist will be Ram Dulapala. Ram is the theme leader at ICRASAT in the area of digital agriculture and youth. Um, and as we think about, you know, the, the importance of combining our innovations in technology with innovations in skill and workforce development, I think he's in a very privileged position to, to speak to that issue and, and to advise us on it. So again, if you have questions, I encourage you to enter them into the, the question box. We will hold all of the questions until the presentations are complete, and then we'll, we'll um, elevate as many of those to the panel as time permits. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to our first presenter, Sean Ferris. Sean, screen is yours. Mr. Ferris, I believe you're muted. Mr. Ferris, we still cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry. OK, so maybe I'll start that again. Sorry, I thought we were. Um, <laughs> open mic there. Okay, so yeah, great. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here um, with the Purdue team. Uh, I've been you know, working with Purdue for the last five years, uh, looking at sort of several different areas in which we can collaborate in the work that I do with Catholic Relief Services, which is, I would say, one of the larger NGOs working out of the States. Um, we work in about 51 countries in agriculture. And uh, we're constantly looking for new ideas and new innovations. So, um, yeah, working with the Purdue team is that idea of checking out what innovations are available and how we can put those into scale. Uh, to kick off today, then, I would like to just um, talk about um, the ideas of technologies over the last, let's say, 10,000 years, um, and just put some of these ideas into context, and then we'll lead to uh, my fellow speakers who will be getting into more detail uh, as technology sort of focuses in on some specific areas. So with that, um, if I could just have my first slide. Great. So yeah, just talking about the idea of the future of farming and how technology plays a role uh, in that transition process. Uh, go to the next slide. So yeah, uh, why is this really important? Well. Um, you know, we have one of the greatest challenges um, facing us at the moment. We have about 30 years to feed another 3 billion people and get to that amazing target of 10 billion people to support across the world. And I think it's not just a case of uh, providing them with sufficient food. It's providing them with great nutrition, uh, good job opportunities within the agricultural sector, and also finding ways of, you know, bringing the full community to really show all of their skills in this area. And agriculture is a big space. It's the largest um, uh, labor user still in the world. Um, and it sort of touches all of our lives in many different ways. So if we look over the last uh, you know, few generations, uh, I'd just like to walk us through some ideas of what were the key revolutions uh, and transition points that started to introduce technologies into our agricultural systems. So with the next slide, let's go back to the beginning. Um, so agriculture in its various forms around the world started around 10,000 years ago. <clears throat> that was the time that people really transitioned out of um, hunting and gathering and started to domesticate specific crops and also work with uh, a subset of the, the animal kingdom. Now, this is a process which has taken quite a long time. So think about this. Over the last 10,000 years, we have domesticated something like 200 different crops and probably about 20 different animals into a system to provide us with an incredibly rich um, dietary diversity, changing right across the world, uh, but providing us with all the different aspects 
of what we now see as our modern uh, diet. Next slide. So the duration of that, about nine and a half thousand years. Second revolution only takes place really in the 17th century up until the early 19th century. Here we have this massive transition away from just um, all of the um, low-tech kind of farming systems, but still very specialized into the industrial revolution. And as Jerry said, at this point, we start to get seed drills, steam engines, but we also get big changes in nutrition of the crops through chemical urea production, nitrogen production. So that really accelerated a lot of um, rapid economic growth um, in specific parts of the world, but also it led to this amazing uh, distribution of products through the first layers of globalization. Now, interestingly, field sizes started to uh, expand quite quickly, tripling in size in you know, that kind of 1750s, 80s area, but labor didn't catch up for a while. So they still had lots of people on the land. But as that technology process started to advance, you started to get a transition from situations where 80 to 90% of the people were working on the land down to 1% of people actually um, supporting uh, crop production in the most industrialized nations uh, today. So uh, as you get this um, increase in productivity, clearly you have cheaper food. All of those things allow more people to get off the land, urbanize, and it was that sort of coupling between the agricultural revolution that really fueled the industrial revolution as well. And I think it's important to say that many countries are still in this agricultural sort of revolution two phase, where they still have, you know, plus 60% of the people working on the land, still a lot of manual production. And, you know, those transitions are slowly happening, but many people are yet to benefit from that full process. Next slide. So think about that last one, duration about 300 years. Next revolution only starts in the 1930s. And again, this is a, uh, at a time when the world was uh, expanding very quickly in terms of population, agriculture was catching up. But as you'll see in the graph, classic hockey stick kind of uh, increase in productivity. We have you know a couple of hundred years where we're producing about between uh, 700 kilograms up to a ton per hectare. And then suddenly with the introduction of improved genetics, uh, with hybridization of crops, we suddenly get this shift where we're starting to get two, three, four, five tons, six tons per hectare in some of the major staple crops. So we're combining things now. We've got um, better fertilizer, we've got uh, agrochemicals coming in, we've got mechanization, but now we've also got improved genetics. And that genetics process is still happening. Uh, GMOs being one of the latest uh, products, which has shifted uh, maize production you know, in places like the States up to 10, 11 tons a hectare. Uh, and now we've got these um, really rapid techniques through things like CRISPR, which is allowing us to take uh, genetics from different areas and build in sort of protection to crops much more quickly than we've ever been able to do in the past. So that genetics process, super important today, but also in the future. Next slide. So duration on that one, about 50 or 60 years. Now, what many of you will think about when you hear the word technology is this idea of um, the, you know, um, computerization and the use of you know, digital technologies. So this is the fourth agricultural revolution. And not, as I said earlier, not all countries have made this transition yet. So this began in around 2010, uh, deep computerization alongside cyber, cybernetics. And this is basically a process which was bringing together this world of the physical side of agriculture alongside this uh, digitization process. So this is often called precision agriculture, digital agriculture, quite often now called smart farming, bringing together digital systems which allow us to integrate programs like finances, like uh, innovation, data-driven systems, all leading to improved productivity on the farm, better products or greater choice of products getting to people in the urban centers. So this is a huge disruption, which is going on right now. And that leads us towards what is just emerging. So if I can go to the next slide, 
right now we're seeing Agricultural Revolution 5. Okay, so this is where we're seeing um, a shift away, as, as Jerry said, labor being sort of disrupted once again with the introduction of autonomous vehicles um, using very data rich environments, which is collecting different types of data in order to provide decision support on the farm so that farmers themselves now are becoming data managers and sort of linked to service providers. So they are managing a very broad process right from um, preparing the land, um, planting through production and then to the marketing and sales, all of that being integrated into a very data rich situation. Now this is causing some segmentation in food systems. Think about sort of high value and low value crops that are being engaged in these processes. Um, in many uh, tropical farming systems, we're seeing a slow introduction of digital processes, a little bit more advances in financial technology, but still quite labor intensive versus some of the industrial nations and the staple crops, which are really moving to a situation where fewer, if any people, are involved in the production of those crops. So you've got some differentiating in farmer types, in crop types, and in use of these different technologies to support these different kind of value chain processes. Okay, and at the same time, genetics is also looking at different processes where you're starting to see this delinking of crops and products. So you start to get people actually generating in the laboratory plant products and processing that into food products. Similar situation happening with animals, uh, livestock and fish, where you're starting to see people actually culture these products. And this is something which is driving down the idea of costs, but also I think taking into account the fact that we are limited in our access to some of these uh, crops and animals. And there's also this kind of important driving you know, new political force, which is looking at animal welfare, and how do we um, support people's desire to have more fish, meat, and high value products, but to do that in a way which is not having a negative effect on the livestock and the environments that we're working in. So, you know, a radical change uh, as we go into Revolution 5, and this is about five or 10 years old, and is really just starting. Final slide then um, is looking at Revolution 6. So this one has not started. And I'm just going to reference you to that um, image on the right hand side, which is, you know, what people are calling donut economics. And this is really a shift now where we're looking not only at the different technologies that we're working on, but whole new types of economic modeling, which is really taking into account the boundaries of what we can do in um, extracting more food um, and uh, more products from, from a limited resource. So not only do we have to feed more people, we have to do that in a way which is sustainable physically on the land, but also sustainable economically and uh, environmentally. And that transition is yet to come. That may indeed be one of our greatest challenges, uh, having to deal with climate change and still produce more food. But that really is the challenge of the next 50 years or 100 years. And that's what makes this area fun. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Jerry. Um, but thanks very much for listening. And I hope that sets the, con sets the context for the following speakers. Thank you. Ex excellent, Sean. Thank you for, for that kind of sweep through history, a very succinct and, and focused view. And uh, it raises so many questions right now. And, and I want to resist the urge to uh, to ask them so that we move on to our second speaker, uh, Dharmendra uh, Saraswat. So uh, Dharmendra, I think the, the screen will be yours. And I think what you'd like to do, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is take this broad sweep of history that Sean has given us and uh, bring it to bear on the conversation currently taking place in India, uh, what kinds of ag innovations are um, taking place, what are the trends that you're seeing in technological development in the subcontinent. So um, to you, Dharmendra. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, uh, for your generous introduction in the beginning. And now 
setting the stage for my presentation. So will you please bring up the slides, please? Yes. So yes, I would like to, to talk about trends and opportunities as I see in India. And, and the reason for my interest is something that I would like to share with you all. Uh, I started my professional career as an agricultural engineer uh, in India's National Agriculture Research System, NARS, as it is called there. I had the privilege to work in the most populous state in India, that is Uttar Pradesh, uh, as an university. And then I moved on to Indian Council of Agriculture Research as a scientist. Uh, there I had the opportunity to work in India's uh, National Institute for Agriculture Engineering, uh, which you will be, uh, be able to easily remember. It's CIA of Engineering and CIA stands for Central Institute of Agricultural Engineering. So although I, I moved to US for my PhD and then uh, made it my home, uh, but because of my uh, initial uh, professional uh, journey in India, I'm still in touch with my colleagues and I, I make it a point uh, to participate in several professional activities that, makes, that take place in India. So uh, next slide, please. And I would like to, to start uh, from the, the last uh, seed of thought that was uh, shared by uh, by Ferris, and that is about sustainability. And and no wonder that when the United Nations decided 17 sustainable development goals, if you look through uh, those goals, you will find that nine of those goals they have some component of increasing agricultural production uh, embedded within them. So next slide, please. Uh, and, then, and then how those goals are important for India. Uh, and you have to understand what is the, the Indian agricultural scenario in order to appreciate the importance of sustainable development goals. Number one, about half of the land area is under cultivation in India. So which is one of the, the few countries in the world that has that kind of a luxury. Uh, but 45% of the adults are directly connected with agriculture. So that is one of the challenges to uh, how to introduce technology that uh, does not become a disruptor to such a large population that is dependent on agriculture. And to make the, uh, the scenario more challenging is the fact that the average monthly income of farmers is only $100, approximately Indian rupees uh, equal to 7,100 rupees. And, and, but agriculture is still very important in the gross domestic product of India, depending on what year we are talking about. Uh, it contributes anywhere between 18 to 20%. But I had this quote there that change is inevitable and changes in the air. And that is because of the fact that at this point of time, India has uh, the highest population that is engaged in agriculture and that population is much younger compared to the rest of the world because their average age is less than 30 years. So in order to make agriculture attractive to that younger population, change is needed and change is on its way and that's what I would like to talk about in next few minutes as to what changes I see happening on the ground. Uh, this is a tree of agri-tech uh, that was created uh, by a report uh, that was created by an industry group in India about a couple of years ago. And what this tree shows is uh, the opportunities and the trends and, and what is needed in order uh, for agri tech to become a sustainable kind of a development process in India. So you start looking from the, the bottom up. Uh, what is happening is that more and more private and public partnerships are coming together in order to solve a number of challenges 
that are before Indian agriculture. And, and then what is also happening is that the, the startups uh, that are coming up, they are also looking at the world as a market. And then they have started approaching uh, the world market for partnership and for learning uh, in order to, to, to understand the trends and, and, and opportunities and technologies and bring those back home and, and improve the ag tech situation there. And as a result of that, there are several uh, policy level changes that have been initiated uh, to provide uh, support to a kind of infrastructure that is going to be very, very promising to Indian agriculture. And then uh, the businesses have their own way of, uh, of doing things and, and they would like to be doing things where uh, they can they can make some money and that is not a bad thing but uh, as a result of their own focus there are some areas that are yet to benefit or that are yet to reap the benefits of uh, the agri tech technology uh, that uh, has a potential to really attract a, a number of youths to to remain in agriculture and and continue uh, feeding a large population uh, that is currently in the country. So next slide, please. Uh, what has been happening in India is something very interesting. Uh, although this data is uh, about a couple of years old, but this is what the latest information is, that uh, about a couple of years ago, uh, there were uh, 450 startups uh, that were founded uh, out of 3,000 plus that were founded all over the globe. And, and the pace of development of the start such is such that every ninth startup in the world is from India. And not only that, uh, these startups have been able to attract a lot of funding. And, and as a result of attracting that funding, uh, within a very short span of three to four years, the funding level has gone up from two times to about 10 times. And then uh, a number of Indian companies have also started exploring uh, global markets uh, through a number of initiatives that uh, the, the Indian government and Indian research infrastructure has launched. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so what has been happening is that because of uh, the efforts made by those startups company to, to uh, become global and, and also to learn uh, from global experiences, uh, a number of untapped agri-tech opportunities have become open because uh, they have realized that by scaling up their operations, they can make their presence felt in the globe. Next, please. And then when you look at uh, the, the kind of uh, agricultural landscape that the startups and business uh, businesses are eyeing in, in, in India, uh, the trends become uh, quite uh, visible. Uh, there are some applications and, and efforts that are being made to improve the supply chain. And, and taking farmers directly to consumers. So the market linkage that is missing and which is considered to be a very critical linkage uh, for any kind of uh, agriculture economy is being created through uh, the business interventions. Uh, there are some efforts being made in digital agriculture. Uh, and although uh, being uh, someone from academia who is involved in digital agriculture, I do see a lot, lot more opportunities and a lot more efforts need to be made uh, in digital agriculture aspect. Then there are some other opportunities uh, uh, that are being pursued by business uh, folks is to provide better access to inputs. And, and, and you know, better access to inputs is again a, a very critical component in the farming industry and, and, and the business uh, and as startups uh, ecosystem see uh, 
that they can make a big difference and they can make an impact uh, in that area. Then there are also farming as a service kind of models being launched uh, so that these services can be made affordable to small and marginal farmers considering that their, that their income level is, is pretty small. And then some of the innovations are also taking roots in farmer financing sector. Uh, but as I see the agri-tech development in India, I, I see that there are a number of dots that the businesses are connect uh, are, are connecting. Uh, but then in the process of connecting that those dots, they are also missing some of the other dots uh, that they uh, may not be perceiving as financially viable for them. So next slide, please. Uh, and, and that becomes quite obvious when you look at the, the sectoral trends that are happening in India. Uh, the most of the funding uh, that is going into the startup ecosystem is in the business to business agri marketplaces kind of in uh, kind of developments then farmer to consumer brands are, are the next that are able to attract a lot of uh, funding farmer platforms are also uh, gaining a lot of funding but when it comes to precision agriculture and innovation foods uh, there is a still a lot of room uh, uh, where, where uh, agri tech uh, can grow similarly the post harvest technology that is another major sector considering that India is one of the major producers of not only food grains but vegetables and fruits as well. Uh, so, so that is another area where I do, do see a lot of opportunities uh, and, and the difference that the startups and business industries can make in the agri-tech uh, framework. Next please. Uh, then talking about the farmers platforms, uh, most of the digital marketplaces that have been built, uh, they have been designed so that farmers can buy inputs, they can access uh, and rent a farm machinery, uh, not only the startups, but there are uh, big business houses that have also uh, started participating in, in the, the renting of farm machinery is concerned. Uh, the, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, at the central level has also come up with some new uh, applications that help uh, in the custom hiring of farm machinery at the All India level. Uh, there are some platforms uh, that provide uh, services uh, to farmers that are mostly advisory in nature and, and then some also provide market linkages to help farmers realize the higher prices. Next slide please. Uh, but as I indicated that precision agriculture is, is an area where the least amount of investment is being made. Although the, the newer technologies such as robotics, drone, field sensors, weather forecasting, satellite remote sensing uh, is being viewed uh, by Indian government and Indian research organizations as, uh, as critical technology to be very, very useful to farmers uh, in the years to come. Uh, the the application of has received a tremendous boost by the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, inviting several uh, private companies to come and help uh, with their uh, with their crop sampling uh, and, and yield prediction kind of uh, services that the 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 ministry provides uh, to other states and at the All India level. Uh, the use of weather forecasting is also getting a lot of boost. Uh, by the state agriculture universities and Indian Meteorological Department uh, coming and launching services that provides uh, the predicted weather forecast to, to farmers uh, at, at, at this point of time at a course level. But in the future, I'm expecting uh, that after the completion of uh, the climate resilient project that Indian Council of Agriculture Research has launched, uh, there will be a village level advisory available to farmers so that they can make decisions about when to plant, when to irrigate, and then when to, to apply fertilizers, chemicals, etc., etc. And the Satellite Remote Sensing India has the distinction of having the, the highest number of Earth observation satellites. And, and 
the Indian Space Research Organization and National Research, uh, National uh, Remote Sensing Agency has been coming up with newer and newer applications that farmers can take advantage of. Next slide, please. Uh, now, let me bring you back to the US scenario. Uh, the kind of technologies uh, that I just talked about in the previous slide are the ones that the farmers are using in US. However, it is important to, to take a look at how they, how they perceive the tremendous amount of data that they receive as a result of using those technologies. Uh, one thing that I want to make clear is that unlike India, where the average uh, age for farmers uh, to this day is less than 30 years, the farmers in US are much, much older. And when they look at the tremendous amount of data that is generated through the use of technology, uh, their responses are all, the, all over the place. Uh, and some of the responses I put on the slide that I'm too low too old to learn new tricks, I'm not good with computers, I'm retiring soon, so there's no point, I can't train my partners and so on and so forth. So what I want to, 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 to share with you is that the same technology that is being viewed as something that is needed in India uh, is viewed very differently, although it is being used in US, it is considered to be uh, very, very useful, but because of some other factors, uh, we need to come up with different strategies so that it becomes much simpler to be used by older farmers. Next slide, please. So, so far I talked about uh, the efforts being made by industry and, and some efforts made by government. And I also wanted to provide you a picture of how the academia is moving about the infusion of new technology and where, where they see the trend going uh, in agriculture. So, so this is a, a review that includes the number of publications that involve uh, the use of machine learning for agriculture applications and the time period uh, that is uh, a part of this review is from 2004 to 2018. And, and what this review suggests is that the most of the contribution from the academia of of the use of new technologies was in the area of crops and particularly yield prediction and yield management and disease management, weeds management and things like that. Uh, about 20% is in livestock and about the same percentage of the academic publications are in the resource uh, management sphere that is soil and water management. So despite the, the resources being very critical and, 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 and one of the factors that, that Jerry mentioned uh, is something that we should be looking at uh, when we talk about agriculture trends. The, it has not been able to, to get the same level of attention from the academia side as much as uh, the, the crop production has received. And, and the livestock is also something very, very important and I, I hope that in in the years to come, livestock is also going to uh, be able to, to achieve the same level of uh, attention from academia as crops have been able to achieve so far. So next slide, please. To sum up my thoughts, uh, uh, what I see is that uh, farmers have to face a number of problems uh, that I have depicted through this mountain. They have to uh, be taking care of the debt that they take to, to run their operations. They are always worried about, about maximizing their profits, minimizing the inputs, uh, also keep an eye on the market, uh, and so many other factors that they have to manage. Uh, and, and the business and governments have tried to provide solutions, uh, but the solutions are all over the place. And although some of them are precise as one of the larger circles shows, but the farmers are more interested in getting solutions that take care of their need with much more accuracy than it is possible now. So this is where I see that designing, developing, and, 
uh, involving farmers with very, very targeted solution is where the Agritech uh, is expected to go. And, and being one of the, the, the proponent of, of Agritech, uh, I have lots of, uh, of hopes and I see lots of opportunities to provide very, very directed solutions to farmers. So with this, thank you for your attention and I look forward to answer your uh, later on. That was, that was, thank you, Dharmendra. Um, really, really brilliant presentation, bringing this right to home in India. And I think the thing that struck me was um, how many of the, the startups that you identified are names that are completely unfamiliar to me and how some of those in the years ahead will likely become household names for many of us as, uh, as some of those uh, startup companies mature and become uh, major players. I think we'll maybe come back to that. And and I also really appreciated your your final remark regarding the need for targeted solutions. And I think we'll we'll come back to that as well. Um, but that is a very nice transition to our third speaker. Um, and so, uh, Ram, uh, I'll hand it over to you now and um, you to pick up where Dharmendra left off and talking about adoption in particular and skill development. Thank you. Sure. Many thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, once again for giving me this opportunity to speak in this fantastic uh, lecture series, which is in honor of uh, Bharat Ratna, Professor C. N. R. Rao. So I won't, you know, spend much time. Let me quickly jump into my slides. Uh, uh, if I can get my slide deck on, yeah, okay. Could you go to the first one, please? I think this is slide number six or, yeah, if you can go to the very first one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this is what I would like to present. Uh, you know, we've seen Sean basically give us a quick introduction about the different kinds of, you know, the revolutions in agriculture. And finally, you know, the revolution that we are all kind of living through the digital revolution, so to say. And then we had Dr. Dharmendra who kind of uh, gave us a, a fantastic, uh, uh, overview of the kind of, uh, you know, the challenges that uh, various entrepreneurs or startups are trying to pick and uh, address through digital technologies. What I would like to do through my presentation is uh, deploy a bit of theory and try to give you a sense of the typology of digital innovations in agriculture. Uh, because, you know, one of my fundamental thinking is uh, though digital agriculture sounds like one big umbrella term, it actually it encompasses many different kinds of typologies of digital innovations. And the thing is, each of these uh, types of innovations has a different innovation ecosystem, has different drivers of adoption, has different kinds of actors and skill sets that are need that are needed and a different kind of a policy response that's kind of a de needed. So that's why what I'm trying to do through my presentation is give you a sense of different types of uh, digital innovations in agriculture and then look at, uh, you know, uh, what could be some of the drivers of uh, scaling each of those different types. Could we move to my next slide, please? Yeah, fundamentally, I'd just like to take a reference to the transaction cost theory proposed by uh, Ronald Coase, a Nobel winning economist. Uh, fundamentally, why I'm using this theory is if you look at what digitalization has been doing or what digitalization does, fundamentally, it actually brings down the cost of transactions, right? I won't go much into detail into this slide, but uh, what I would like to draw your attention to is to the last uh, to the bottom left of my slide, wherein uh, World Bank had published a fantastic paper in the year 2016 about digital agriculture. And what that paper very convincingly argued is that as and when, you know, as, uh, as digitalization becomes more and more rampant, you see digitalization is not like a one big bang uh, phenomenon, right? It's a very gradual trickle down approach. It starts gradually and it kind of, you know, systems become more and more digitalized, right? So what this paper very convincingly tries to argue is as and when digitalization becomes more deeper and deeper and becomes more rampant, uh, it leads to transaction costs falling and as and when transaction costs in the system, you know, keep on reducing, uh, it leads to some very interesting phenomenon. Uh, some of those phenomena are, it leads to more inclusion. Uh, you know, it leads to more efficiency. And finally, it leads to a lot of innovation. So 
to quickly give you an example of what I'm trying to convey, you know, th through the use of e extension, you know, the most popular use of uh, ICTs or digital technologies has in agriculture has been in the realm of extension, right? So if you look at the example, as and when you start digitizing your extension, fundamentally what happens is in countries like India, you know, traditional extension is serviced through uh, agriculture extension officers who make physical visits to farmers. Now, we are a resource constrained country, so we do not have the luxury of having enough number of extension officers so that there is adequate extension coverage. Through digital technologies, what happens is populations that never had access to formal extension also start receiving some kind of an advisory or extension or video based lectures, etc. So that's an example of how digital technologies can lead to more inclusion. Second, how does it lead to more efficiency? The same agriculture extension officer who used to probably, you know, cater to say 300 or 400 farmers a year through field visits today using WhatsApp or through video channels or through lectures or, you know, through the likes of innovations of the likes of digital greens has, you know, the whole process of extension has become a lot more efficient. So that's the second big phenomenon that digitalization leads to. Now, the last and the most interesting uh, consequence of digitalization is, of course, innovation. Uh, this is you know, uh, you know, this in, in an alternative world, we are beginning to call this thing as disruption, you know. So today you have the apps of the likes of Plantix, you know, which are using deep neural networks and image recognition and, you know, are bringing mobile apps to farmers that, you know, that mimic the, the functions of an expert. So here is a quick example of how digitalization leads to lowering of transaction costs which in turn leads to this phenomenon at a broad level called inclusion, efficiency and innovation. Can I move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so what I've tried to do here is, uh, as, I, as I just told at the start of my presentation, uh, you know, digital agriculture, though sounds like one big word, it actually comprises of a number of different things like just take the example of digital, right? What do you, what really constitutes digital technology? It could be mobile phone, cloud, uh, you know, e-commerce platforms to, you know, all the way to IOTs, robots, whatnots. And the, the term itself is evolving. Each passing day, you have a lot of new, uh, you know, digital innovations that are making up, right? So if kind of that is the context, how do you really understand this, uh, you know, this, this elephant or this big animal called digital agriculture? This is my humble attempt where uh, I have tried to create what is what I call as a canvas of ICTs for agriculture, where I'm trying to define different types of digital innovations in agriculture. And what is the basis for me to arrive at these types? So what I've done is if you look at the center of my uh, screen, I've actually placed smallholder farmer. Okay. And then I've tried to, you know, take a value chain perspective and then really try to understand what are the different actors uh, or the institutions uh, that a smallholder farmer or a farmer has to deal with, uh, you know, during the course of their agriculture. Okay. So as you can see, I have uh, come up with some very fancy terms for the one of the first institutions that I believe that a smallholder farmer has to interact with is research institutions because at the end of the day, uh, it is the research institutions that are actually, you know, driving a lot of the technology R&D and technology enhancements in, you know, as far as agriculture is concerned, but farmers have to somehow interface or interact with these research institutions in order to access that technology or the agriculture know-how. And I've also kind of written down how it is, how is it that farmers interface or interact with these uh, research institutions. Uh, you have these knowledge intermediaries in between, which are the traditional extension or increasingly a lot of non-governmental organizations, a lot of uh, you know, extension organizations are coming. So these are, you know, the institutions that are kind of a bridge between the research institutions and the smallholder farmers. The second big actor that, uh, you know, plays a very important life in the lives of smallholder farmers, especially in the context of countries like India are governments because governments through their policy making, through their, uh, you know, procurement policies, through their policies around GMOs, etc or through their interventions around subsidies, uh, cash transfers, direct benefit transfers also are a very important institutional actor in the life of a smallholder farmer. And how is it that governments actually interface with smallholder farmers? They have their own line departments. They have a secretariat. There is a district agriculture officer. There is a Mandal agriculture officer all the way, right? Similarly, 
a private sector increasingly has you know is playing a very important role in the lives of the smallholder farmer and how is it that the private sector interfaces with smallholder farmers they set up their own distribution channels and smallholder farmers themselves you know uh, have to interface with consumers because end of the day whatever they produce has to get consumed by someone so that's where the consumers play a very important role or a very important actor in the lives of the smallholder farmer and what is the bridge that connects the uh, smallholder farmer with the consumers i have put that as ag marketing structures like in a country like india we have the national agriculture market or the apmc system which actually is a very structured way of linking smallholder farmers to, through to the end consumers now apart from these four big institutional actors if you see i also believe that the community of farmers you know the peers uh, the society around the farmer also plays a very important role uh, you know in agriculture and in the day to day functioning of a smallholder farmer so i have also put that as peer to peer collaboration platform and finally uh, you know farmers themselves you know they have their own you know they have to do their actual agriculture operations and that's where i you know if you kind of look at um, an oval to the bottom i have also put that as operations so essentially this is my own way of saying that okay these are the different types of uh, you know interactions that smallholder farmers have with different actors and then i ask the question that if i were to bring in digitalization uh, what would be you know how would digitalization basically impact uh, you know um, uh, agriculture in different ways uh, and that's what i am calling as canvas of icts for ag can i just move to my uh, next slide please here again as i said i am again calling this as the innovation spectrum of agriculture you know it's just a is just a repeat of my previous slide these are the six broad thematic areas that i am defining uh, you know that uh, as far as uh, digitalization of agriculture is concerned and what i would like to also you know underscore here is now digital agriculture is very different vis-a-vis -vis some of the past revolutions of agriculture in the sense that most of the past revolutions in agriculture if you see were all basically centered on the farm the digital agriculture is one unique uh, revolution in the sense that you know the the revolution the the change is occurring at multiple points in the agriculture value chain right so therefore what happens is uh, you know lot of the little little changes uh, that are happening at multiple points in the agricultural you know in the agriculture value chain have the potential to kind of cumulatively create a you know a change that is much bigger than the sum of the individual parts right and again in each of these thematic areas uh, what i've tried to do is give you a sense of the uh, the the flavor of digitalization that happens now what do i mean by that i'll just give you a very quick example suppose you know you take the case of agriculture marketing in india right as i said in agri in uh, as far as agriculture marketing in india is concerned farmers go through what are called as agriculture produce marketing committees in order to sell their produce and get their produce finally to the consumers now if i start digitalizing as india government of india has been doing what they have been trying to do is through the enam they have just been digitalizing this entire process of farmer to consumer linkage now that is an example of simple evolution right they, which leads to some incremental gains and some transaction cost beneficiaries so there will be some benefit that kind of happens so there is fundamentally no structural change or no major disruption but you know overall the system becomes slightly more efficient but what is most interesting is what we call as disruption is suddenly you have platforms like a big basket or a dehat or a big hat as uh, dr dharmendra saraswat mentioned all these platforms are coming up with e-commerce platforms linking farmers directly with end consumers now that is an example of disintermediation so quickly in the interest of time across all these six thematic areas that i have def i have defined digitalization can lead to simple evolutionary changes which leads to some incremental changes some transaction cost beneficiaries but in each of the six thematic areas there is a potential for deploying digitalization which can lead to lot of dis disruption and through my own research i have tried to categorize uh, how does disruption basically look across the six thematic areas essentially i could say disruption basically you know occurs in the form of disintermediation that is you know suddenly through digital platforms there is a number of 
you know redundant players that are coming out of the system and you have a lot of digital platforms leading to a lot of efficiency gains you know everybody uh, system itself becoming more efficient so that is one broad thematic area within um, disruption the second big uh, uh, theme that kind of seems to be underpinning disruption in each of these six thematic area is also what is what i am calling as uberization made popular by the most popular startup called uber where there is a lot of vibrating economy that seems to be occurring in parts and i myself thanks to covid i am seeing a lot of drone based uh, use uh, on an uber basis uh, that is happening in small clusters in india the third big theme uh, that is underpinning disruption again in each of these thematic areas is what i have called as expert system that is increasingly we are seeing the use of ai ml and big data uh, where a lot of chatbots a lot of mobile apps increasingly are filling in the human capacity and the institutional capacity that we are lagging and somehow you know uh, creating this system so pr i will probably pause there if you can just go to my next slide it's a summary slide uh, what i would like to present is uh, you know digitalization is a multi actor multi scale and a multi dimensional activity uh, let's not look at it as you know one big big bang and you can't understand it it happens in a very organic way therefore to in order to manage digitalization it is essential that we build team teams with very diverse skills and i would also like to underscore the importance of soft skills especially you know in, in this you know when you become when you digitize a system there's a lot of change there's a lot of tension that happens in the system so let's not underscore the need to undertake change management so therefore soft skills are very very essential uh, the second big bullet i would also like to highlight is we need orgware innovation uh, because digitalization is a very different phenomenon uh, so there is a lot of adaptation from government a lot of new thinking a lot of new organizations uh, that need to emerge in order for us to manage this transition of digitalization so as to you know uh, make this change a lot more equitable uh, a lot more uh, you know pain free so to say otherwise sometimes as uh, dr uh, uh, as uh, dr uh, jerry mentioned in the start uh, sometimes digitalization can also lead to some unintended consequences uh, and uh, i won't go through rest of my points but i would also like to underscore a point, my bullet number 5 uh, where inflection points you know inflection points are very real ladies and gentlemen uh, reason i say this is covid has actually you know brought about a number of changes which i personally thought would take 4 to 5 years in indian agriculture you know the increasing use of whatsapp for, by farmers themselves you know farmers self organizing self regulating linking directly so inflection points are very very real and these are unpredictable and last not not the least the discipline of digital agriculture itself uh, needs a lot of research it needs a lot of programmatic focus a lot of scientific rigor and there's a lot of institutionalization of knowledge that is needed uh, not just for the sake of academics but i think you know uh, ultimately the digital agriculture has to be a community and a society driven phenomenon uh, and uh, research i think can inform this entire community progress uh, in a much more sensible and a scientific way uh, probably uh, that was my final point uh, thank you once again for this opportunity look forward to your uh, questions hi thank you so much for that um, presentation and you know as i look at your summary slide and the bullet points I think that each of them could occupy us uh, as an entire topic of conversation um, for, a, for a meeting like this. Um, lots and lots of ideas out here. And so now the, the challenge for me as moderator yeah. is to um, take the, the, num the, the very interesting questions that have been entered into the, the chat and suggested as, long as, as well as some that I have in mind myself and try to uh, moderate a discussion on this point. And so I'd like to begin kind of very broadly um, asking a question about adoption that I think each of you um, can speak to. And I think each of you has something to, to offer on this subject. Um, you know, as we think about not just agriculture, but, but um, you know, manufacturing, industry, um, all, all aspects of life, when uh, innovations are introduced, it's often the case that, that some individuals, some firms uh, are interested in innovation and are willing to innovate. Um, we, we call those early adopters often. And certainly if we think about the green revolution 
and how it affected agriculture in India. Um, there was nothing about the technology of, of improved seeds and fertilizer and water management per se that favored large farmers over small. But we did see that in the early years of the Green Revolution, the early adopters seemed to be certain types of firms, uh, farms that, that benefited from those technolog technologies um, compared with the late adopters. And um, Ram, I think you, you, know, you made the point that um, digitalization has the potential to be inclusive and that kind of has in its in its um, buried in its idea the the thought that um, somehow magically if we digitize agriculture that everyone will be included in that mm -hmm. revolution um, yet mm -hmm. we know that there will be early adopters and early winners um, and there will be late adopters who for reasons of risk or reasons of financing or simply for reasons that Darmendra indicated in from the survey of US farmers um, demographic or other reasons may just not be simply interested in innovating. So the question that I'd like to put out to the panel uh, for each of you to comment on is what do you see as the main barriers to adoption in, in these new technologies and how can we overcome them? Um, and obviously that might um, um, take on various aspects that you've touched on. So maybe I'll, I'll just Take you in the order that you presented. We'll start with Sean. If you and if you you don't have much to say on the subject, we can move on to the next. Um, but I'll give it to you now. Great, thanks, Jerry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. This um, issue around new technologies and adoption is something that we deal with every day. You know, we want um, farmers to get access to new technologies, new ideas. And to be able to bring those together, not just as single components, but to put those in a better farming system. Um, you know, I, I think that um, when we're looking at adoption um, and access, there's a lot of different segmentation in the market. And as Ram has said, there's a lot of disruption in the market because of the way it's being introduced. But, you know, one of the things that I always think about is that, you know, along with those agricultural revolutions, just think about some ideas of infrastructure. You know, the idea of, we started with paths, we sort of made them a bit bigger, got horses on them, made roads, and that was a big adoption which allowed lots of other technologies to come into a better connected world, just with roads. And then we started uh, thinking about things like railways to speed it up. And, you know, that had a big influence on, you know, travel, within countries and then of course shipping got it to other places and that allowed more technologies to become available to people when they saw those things. And I think that you know the information highway started with communication and now it's shifted around from something that just allowed you to receive information to now that you're using this sort of digital highway to bring together lots of different um, networks as Ram was saying but also the ability to bundle services and allow people to connect the dots, uh, as Dr. Dementro was saying, in a way that they can use technology, not just as single ideas, but really bringing systems thinking to play. So, you know, I think that what has been most interesting in the last 20 years is just the massive investment in digitization right across the world. And certainly, you know, um, in my career, we've gone from having very complicated kind of VHF radios to talk to each other in remote places, going through satellite phones, and now everybody has a mobile phone. And you know, there, are, there is, I think it's becoming difficult now to go to places where there isn't access to networks. They exist, but um, you know, it's getting more and more hard to find those places. Other barriers though, uh, literacy, numeracy, digital functionality, gender all of those things are still playing a role in not allowing you know a large number or a big percentage of people to be more effective to use those systems so i think you know alongside all of the smart technologies there's still some basic things that we need to also get right education being a really important one but just you know sort of equity being important 
And I think, you know, those things have to change also to adjust to this new world. And so I think you'll accelerate the adoption curves, but only when we can get more people playing and more people able to interface with the systems. And that's a lot of our work that we're doing is really trying to enable people to leverage that massive investment that governments and private sector have put into digitization um, yeah, and uh, get them to play a more effective role. So to me, it's a lot about getting people to play in the same process. Back to you. Great, Dharmendra. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, I would like to add to uh, a number of uh, factors uh, that uh, was offered by uh, Dr. Ferris. Uh, and I think that cost uh, is another very important consideration uh, that is to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, and apart from the cost, uh, the, the, the generations of humans have an inherent uh, distress, distress to uh, change. So that also sometimes become a, a barrier. And uh, both of these uh, factors have been overcome in India. Uh, Number one, because one industry player came and suddenly dropped the cost of accessing data over smartphones. Uh, and as a result of that, the cheapest uh, data plan that is available anywhere in the world, and that is in India, and, and that really made a big difference. Uh, the, the cost of uh, mobile phones has also uh, come down uh, very significantly and, and the COVID-19 pandemic as I was reading in one of the newspapers uh, has really, really changed the entire landscape because the only way and only mode uh, for, for farmers to, uh, to get connected to uh, the markets or get connected to their peers or to get advice uh, was was through the mobile devices. So uh, the cheap data plan, uh, that is the cost factor, and uh, some really unforeseen kind of event that forced everybody to, to really adapt uh, to, to modern technology uh, has proven beneficial in this particular case. So this is my two cents about the two factors uh, that were barriers, but have been overcome through uh, the business intervention and also an, a pandemic that nobody could envision uh, can really uh, make everybody stay at home and, and, and get connected to the rest of the world through their mobile devices. Ram, your thoughts? Yeah. Uh slightly uh, different um, you see it's a it's a very pertinent question uh, the question about adoption uh, but in the case of digital revolution uh, i think the macro factors that are actually driving digitalization of agriculture are slightly different as dr dharmendra pointed out uh, you know just to put it in a very simple way farmers aren't buying mobile phones or foreign farmers aren't using sim cards uh, just for you know accessing agriculture advisory right you know, the market is progressing such a way that, you know, today uh, 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 mobile phone has have become cheaper, smartphones are become more accessible. So farmers are increasingly kind of becoming part of the networked economy, right? And once they are part of this networked economy, that's where, you know, as agricultural development professionals or as agriculture as an industry kind of is looking at how do you use this new alternate channel to reach farmers uh, and provision services and advisory, right? Uh, and and yeah, the, the second big question is that, okay, if a farmer receives an advisory, does that really lead to a practice change? You know, do farmers suddenly start trusting all that? No, that's where I feel uh, the phenomenon is a lot more complex. And my own personal opinion, possibly uh, a lot of digital agriculture till date has been more supply driven. That is, we've been thinking in terms of provisioning of services with very little uh, thinking around, okay, 
if a farmer starts receiving an advisory of there is a new app right now what are those social factors what are those you know uh, individual education attitude risk uh, appetite what are those individual characteristics uh, and what kind of a crop and what's the nature of the crop is it a risky crop and how is it dependent on weather so there's probably we are slightly as a community under invested in terms of really trying to understand the human com computer interaction as far as agriculture is concerned or some of the understanding the social science factors uh, that really lead to an adoption that is you know from a time a farmer receives an advisory as an sms or an app from there to actually farmer you know really making a change in terms of what they do on the farm or in terms of practice change right i think that probably is an area of research uh, that needs a lot of investment not just from the public sector but also from the private sector as well uh, because ultimately when you understand the user behavior when when you understand the causal factors of adoption better that leads to more uh, business even for private sector so those are my two cents great thank you um there are quite a few questions in the chat related to um sort of the the private sector but i'd like to to kind of embed the questions about the private sector more broadly um so if we think about efforts to promote and sustain agrotechnology in india um what role is being played by traditional farm inputs uh, companies what role is being played by the government what you know what role is being played by these startup companies and and then even more generally if you look at like the indian council for agricultural research um i think that icar is also you know providing support for agritech so how do we how do we understand the constellation of you know the private the public sectors in uh, partnering or competing in some cases to to develop and promote these technologies maybe maybe ram you would have comments on that and and perhaps darmendra as sure. well sure sure uh, yeah i mean uh, i think a lot of the ag tech uh, um, drive so to say is being driven by a lot of private sector a lot of private capital and if you kind of see the immediate uh, reaction it's more like a spillover effect like you you had a flipkart in india you had an amazon india so people are trying to take that model more urban centric uh, you know uh, uh, urban based uh, 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 digital models and they're trying to pivot and you know pilot that in rural model so probably the first push of digital agriculture is actually coming from private sector and it's more spillover it's due to adjacency in other sectors and people are trying this uh also you know once this revolution is catching up and showing some impacts i do see a lot of the traditional incumbent input players also beginning to take notice uh, because a uh, lot of input companies are always you know look for innovations uh, and traditionally if you look at the agri input industry in india uh, it's kind of been a little cut off from the rest of the uh, other sectors in the economy right so in that sense as and when these a lot of these ag techs are actually driving a lot of digital innovations coming up with new innovation models and these agri input companies are also now beginning to take uh, focus uh, as far as government is concerned i think since 2014 15 especially with the launch of programs like digital india and as uh, dr saraswat said coming of geo smartphones uh, becoming a lot cheaper uh, government also has uh, begun to start uh, taking a lot of notice and governments on its part also you know is pumping in a lot of innovation money like for instance as i told you know this initiative called enam which is a massive a uh, project about 100 million dollar digitization of agricultural markets that's being undertaken by government apart from that you know we also have an agency called mncfc uh, which is also you know pumping in a lot of innovation grants especially for the innovative use of uh, uh, remote sensing and digital technologies uh, for doing remote crop assessments so yeah the complete all the ecosystem is actually coming together but primarily i think the drive is actually coming from a lot of private sector and startups Yeah, and I would like to supplement. Great, thank you. What, yeah, I would like to supplement what Ram has uh, has shared. Uh, there are two uh, large tractor manufacturers in India, uh, namely Mahindra and Tafe Tractor and Farm Equipment Limited. So both of them have uh, recognized the need for uh, 
promoting custom hiring of farm equipment. So they uh, came up with uh, Tringo and J Farm, namely two applications, and, and they have uh, promoted it in a big way. Uh, as far as the 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 government effort is concerned, like Ram has indicated, uh, some of the big initiatives that government has taken. I would like to to talk about what ICAR has been doing in this sphere. Uh, as far as my knowledge goes, uh, ICAR entered into a memorandum of understanding with National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, uh, known by the acronym NABARD in India. And, and the, the MOU was basically uh, meant for promoting sustainable and climate resilient farming technology. So, so they would promote those entrepreneurs who undertake uh, such kind of technology development activities and the loans uh, to those entrepreneurs would be arranged uh, through this uh, kind of a setup that exists between ICAR and NABARD. And uh, what ICAR has also done is that they have a very large network of uh, the Farmer Service Center known by uh, the acronym KVK, Krishi Vikyan Kendra. So they, and through those uh, KVK setup, uh, ICAR promote a lot of technologies that have been field tested under various agroecological conditions in India. So, so they have come up with a number of successful technologies uh, so that uh, young entrepreneurs can take a look at and, and uh, and run it, run with it with uh, uh, with newer ideas. Uh, then uh, what ICAR has also done is that they have uh, started a Pusa Krisi incubator uh, that is housed within the campus of Indian Agriculture Research Institute, uh, the IRI, uh, in New Delhi, and that. Pusa Krisi Incubator is helping startups get access to global market through mutual benefit and shared learning. Uh, then recently, as you know, that Purdue uh, has partnered with uh, Cisco AgriTech Challenge, uh, where uh, 25 uh, semi-finalists have been selected and the winner is going to get two crores uh, of uh, rupee to, to pursue their startup ideas further. And besides that, ICAR has also started organizing Agri Hackathon. And, and through that Agri Hackathon effort, they are uh, trying to, uh, to invite a lot more youngsters to, to take a look at the opportunities that, that exist in agriculture, come up with some innovative solutions. And, and some of the ideas are then promoted by ICAR so that they come to fruition. So thank you. So uh, thank you both. There's just a tremendous number of really great questions um, coming in. And I apologize to everyone who's offered a question um, that we haven't been able to elevate into the conversation. Uh, time is just uh, not on our side. There's so much to explore here. and and limited time enable, uh, uh, for us to do that. But I do know that there's a good discussion going on as well among audience members, and I encourage you to continue that. And um, some of our panelists may um, also try to weigh in on that um, if possible. So that brings us to the close. We, um, we've used the time that we had uh, available to us. I wanna again thank um, uh, the, the hosts and the, the um, the organizers for putting agriculture on the agenda and for inviting us to participate today in this most important conversation. Um, and again, my thanks to the panelists, uh, Sean Ferris from CRS, uh, Dharmendra Saraswat from, from Purdue, and uh, Ram Dolapala from ICRASAT. So thank you all for, for being here today, for your time, your very thoughtful uh, comments and the, the energy and enthusiasm that you brought to the, to the topic. I want to also thank all of the panelists, uh, in addition to the panelists, all of the audience members. Um, thank you for joining us today, for providing questions, and for, for giving us your time and attention. Um, thank you, everyone.